All right, welcome back, folks. Connecting dots here with a second video of the day. The first one uh, earlier today, three hours ago, was uh, connecting dots to the Fukushima ice wall leaks and contaminated fish. I'm not going to go over that one, uh, but I recommend if you're new to this whole Fukushima thing and you think the fish are all dying or whatever, well, then I recommend you go watch at least the end of that video because I share some couple articles regarding fish that were caught off the coast of Japan and how they were increasing in radiation levels each time they keep catching kept uh, catching the fish the levels were, uh, were testing higher and higher the last one it was 5,500 times above the limit anyhow a continuation and on uh, well you know I receive an email and that's why I've decided well I'll deal with the email because I know where she got that story and I'm speaking about the email that was sent to me. Um, obviously, the viewer just came across Kevin Blanche's more recent video. As I was making my video today, Kevin Blanche was making another one of his doomsday. Salmon are all dead, yada, yada, yada. Again, not a single proof, no evidence, nothing, nothing. It's unfortunately, he just babbles his mouth away no evidence of anything so I'm going to share with you the truth on it and it's something I spoke a little uh, about a little while back is the blob Pacific blob so in this article here and everything you you see in my videos are all linked down below so if you're interested in uh, following up a little bit more reading the entire article or sharing with someone you can uh, follow it down below in the show more tab I'm going to go jump to uh, the juice of it here more specifically uh, the Pacific Ocean and topic that we're talking about, what we're speaking about. So, um, or is it, say here, something about, okay, right here. In the North Pacific, there are two similar oscillations that differ in their time interval. The Pacific uh, Decadal Oscillation, the PDO, was discovered by Nate Mantua, a co-director of UW JISAO Climate Impact Group while studying salmon populations in 1997. It lasts anywhere from 10 to 20 years and changes regional sea surface temperatures. The other oscillation is the El Nino La Nina pattern, which is uh, essentially a short lived PDO. And when these um, oscillations are in their positive phase, sea surface temperatures are warmer than normal and the probability of a marine heat wave drastically increases. This variance in temperature makes marine heat waves difficult to study because the averages are constantly changing. The results showed that the probability of a warm an anomaly decreased as the intensity and duration increased. There are more and more, uh, there are uh, many more small, short lived warm anomalies across the ocean than large persistent events. And that makes a lot of sense, Scannell said. If you think about earthquake frequency, the really big ones happen less often than small tremors. So in the natural world, uh, these really big warming events are unusual. Scannell also had to address the long term warming trend in the ocean caused by anthropogenic climate change. She subtracted the linear warmer, uh, warm, linear warming trend from the 65 years of data she was using so that the average was zero across the timeline and analyzed the anomalies off that flat average. She said if we kept the trend in, everything would be getting warmer. So there would generally be more big events, uh, as Canal said. Everything would start to look like a marine heat wave based on our definition. The most recent marine heat wave started in 2013 off the coast of Washington. As I said, I live here on Vancouver Island, right across the way here from Washington, and was nicknamed the Blob by Nicholas Bonn, a research meteorologist at UWJISAO. It lasted just under two years and had devastating effects on the coastal ecosystem. So there's something that we could measure. We had no one taking any Fukushima radiation testing of any marine life like they had promised, even though they raised thousands of dollars under that same um, lie that they were going out there to test. And I'm speaking specifically about Dana Dernford right now, 
who collected thousands of dollars, and more specifically, uh, the boat that he took on this 260-day tour was actually uh, uh, someone that uh, took a lien out on his home for $16,500, the late Jeff Palco, and Jeff ended up taking his life after realizing he'd been defrauded and was not getting his money back for the boat, and Dana had not lived up to his promises of doing marine testing of some of the marine life and showing everyone in videos the results of the test. At least here we had the red tide event here. The, the blobs uh, stim uh, stimulated an explosion of phytoplankton, a type of floating algae that is the base of marine food chain in the west coast. Phytoplankton grow better in warm water and use sunlight and dissolve nutrients to rapidly, uh, to rapidly prolifer pr proliferate. Uh, this eventually led to an increase in toxic algae species along the west coast, the red tide. It was the biggest harmful algae bloom we've seen along this coast, said Samantha Sidlik, a research scientist at JISAO. It stretched from California all the way to Alaska in 2015. There were epic closures of fisheries because of all the harmful toxins that were out there. According to Sidlicky, seabirds and marine mammals, this is important folks because in 2015 we had all these people saying to everyone that it was always Fukushima radiation that was causing the harm. No one ever dared speak about the blob. None of them except me, of course, and they all what? call me a liar. Well, I'm sorry, but at least there was testing. We had evidence. We had sea readings, uh, uh, the surface of the water readings. We had uh, testing of the mammals, the crabs. It was evident. Uh, it goes on to say here that marine mammals were also negatively impacted by the warm temperatures during the blob. Marine mammals such as walrus and seals continued to feed on toxic invertebrates poisoned by the harmful algae bloom. In response to warm surface water, many fish remained deeper in the water column where temperatures were lower. These depths often exceeded the maximum diving cap capabilities of some seabirds rendering their main source of food inaccessible. That's why I covered the stories on the birds that were washing up in Alaska. I, I shared with you it had to do with the blob again. You're, you're getting more evidence here what's going on, folks. I hope you folks can understand here. It was on the field of marine heat wave research is only just emerging, and studies like Scannell's are crucial to establishing a cohesive definition of these larger events so they can be compared in the future. So yes, this was a, a very unusual event. Unfortunately on YouTube we, we didn't have anyone, we didn't have, this was not the truth movement that many of you believe was out here. I hope you've realized this by now and if not, well, this is going to be your wake up YouTube channel because you'll soon realize I don't flow with the rest out here, okay? I'm not part of that uh, Fukushima fraud squad or anything else squad out here. Uh, I run on my own, I do my own stuff, and uh, when I speak out against these people, that's where many of you start to chime in. Yes, you can see it also, and that's exactly why my other YouTube channel, The Silver Gold Man, has just gone ballistic here since uh, September of 2014 when I first opened it, because many people could see exactly what I was seeing, what was taking place on YouTube within the silver and gold economic sector and how they all interconnected. So the same thing here with the BP Earth to the Watch and the Dabu Sevens and the rest of them, it's fear, 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 Not never a real good uh, storyline and common sense to the whole um, breakdown of what's going on. So here's a, a weird one here. You're, you're, you know, many are saying uh, Fukushima is killing all the fish in the Pacific Ocean, right? Well, maybe it's making them unusually big. Oh, they're going to say, well, it's, yeah, it's the radiation. Well, here, uh, this story here goes into a little bit more than that. So, uh, fishery researchers are investigating why pink salmon, a uh, staple of Southeast Alaska's commercial fisheries, seem to be growing bigger every year, while other longer-lived salmon species are getting smaller in size. So, there you go. What, the radiation is affecting... Uh, one size making them big, and the other ones, well, they're getting smaller. So is it radiation? I, I, well, you know what? If you listen to the YouTubers, they're probably going to take this story and twist the bejesus out of it, but I'm going to read the, the, the juice of it so you can make some sense of it, okay? <clears throat> 
and, and this story here goes on uh, these pink salmon that we've got in, in in early this year they're talking about 2016 are some of the largest i've seen in quite a long time said joyce uh john joyce here fisheries research biologist at the noaa um in uh, an interview last summer sorry that was last summer um <clears throat> at uh, oak creek flowed over rocks and returned uh, salmon lingered in a nearby pool. Joyce explained it, how the creeks weir provided more than 35 years of continuous data and is valuable for climate change research. Uh, we've had a real warm event, uh, said Joyce. It, it would be logical to assume that it's creating a pretty good growth regime for these fish and we're seeing evidence of that with these, with the, these fish coming back. So they're saying that uh, the uh, adult pink salmon are returning earlier this uh, every summer, a total of two weeks earlier since counting started. Pinks returning in 2015 also came back in bigger numbers, not smaller numbers, bigger numbers, folks, in northern part of southeast Alaska, and they're probably and they're bigger than usual. Not probably, they're bigger than usual. So I guess they're not running out of food out there, eh? I guess. Well, it depends where they eat, right? And the blob wasn't everywhere. If you saw in that image, certain locations were more affected than others. And it's something I've been saying here with the testing of the seafood. It has, it, we need to uh, deal with specific species that we know may get caught up in uh, uh, bioaccumulation of radioactive isotopes due to the species, uh, or I should say more precisely, what their food, what their diet is, right? You are what you eat, essentially. So uh, it goes on to say here that um, uh, for uh, just a panhandle, pink salmon harvested in 2015 uh, were 12% heavier than the previous year. Hmm. So, so there you go. So much for the story is everything is dying, eh? During the salmon uh, ocean ecology meeting in Juneau in March, research biologists presented their findings suggesting pink salmon runs may be affecting the growth and abundance of other species in North Pacific. So there you go. It's not necessarily Fukushima. They're talking about these, um, essentially what they eat here. So I'm going to go straight down to the best of it here because I don't want to read this entire story. I might. So it says, uh, 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 Shawl wonders if the salmon's forage base is altered by the recent swing in water temperature. When uh, ocean temperatures are cool, young pink salmon usually grow by feeding on the bigger and fattier zooplankton. It just so happens that uh, squid like zooplankton also. Uh, pink salmon may be changing the whole forage base similar to the phenomenon of fishing down the marine food web or taking out the squid, which is a direct competitor with them for zooplankton, Shaw said. Pink salmon is an intragild predator that eats, that both eats its com its competitor and eats the prey of its competitor. It's possible that when pink salmon bulk up on consuming squid, they're also depriving offshore coho and chinook of their primary source of food. So there you go. In this story here, it kind of getting uh, a sense, essentially, uh, with the warmer um, oceans, one species of salmon is booming, they're doing well, while the other ones closer to the shore are not doing so well. And that's, you know, it's all about where you are, location, location, location. Shaw acknowledges they're still, they still haven't pinned down where, uh, whether the young pinks are benefiting from zooplankton because uh, those older pinks are scooping up all the squid. And since uh, less fatty zooplankton are prevalent during warmer uh, conditions, they're not sure how pinks are still getting bigger with the recent warm water blob in the Northeast Pacific. If it's driven by climate, then you would expect going back into a warmer period uh, that there would have been smaller in size. And yet pink salmon have continued to grow larger in 2015, Charles said, and they've also followed this recent trend which suggests that there's something more than just change in climate, uh, that there are in, uh, that there is plenty of food out there and somehow there are, did you guys get that that there is plenty of food out there and there's some uh, somehow they are benefiting not a lack of food again 
except I believe where the blob was. And that's where these stories here that we were picking up last year seem to be all blob related. So um, <clears throat> what they're saying here is basically what you see is a very strong alternating year pattern. Pink salmon are about 40% more abundant in odd numbered years. When you see lots of pink salmon, you see the reduction in growth in red salmon. It's fairly consistent over time. So here's another good story here. This is again from April 2016. It's official. Unusual Atlantic salmon catch confirmed in Clyde River. None of it. I'm not going to go over the whole story, but essentially um, what they say here is that um, Dumal is trying to figure out why the salmon are pushing further north. She began studying Pacific salmon in the Northeast Territories five years ago. Um, she recently expanded the program to Nunavut, where along the Clyde River, she said Atlantic salmon have been reported elsewhere on Baffet Island. Chum salmon have also been reported further west in the territory of Hamlet and Klugluklug. We think that the warmer water cycles in the marine environment are allowing increased access for species, for species that wouldn't normally go that far north. Now, if you're a regular listener to mine here on Connecting Dots 2, you may recall this is what I was sharing with you. I believe it was in the summer of 2014. Uh, was it 2014, 2015? I'd have to go back and double check. But I was sharing with you how there were um, divers, especially one specific diver, I was sharing her story. She'd been diving at the same location for the last 17 years off the coast of California. And uh, she was um, sharing with us how she had never seen so many fish in that one specific location after diving there for 17 years. And um, more specifically, these were warm water fish that were normally just seen occasionally you would see one. And I believe it's because of these warmer waters, you're having that, uh, you know, the change of effect, you know, they're, they are going to move somewhere where it's a little bit cooler and the other ones that like it warmer, well, they happen to find new habitat here. So uh, they're moving on up north and all due because of the warming of the ocean here with the blob. So uh, another story here, again, this is April 15, Pacific Council works out the West Coast salmon season, except in the Puget Sound during a continuous meeting, contentious meeting, I should say. And it says here that um, the negotiations in, in Vancouver, Washington, resulted in seasons for ocean fisheries, but no resolution for Puget Sound fisheries in Washington. Generally, Commercial fishermen across the West Coast are faced with overall reductions of less than half of what they could catch in 2015. But on the other hand, here we go. April 18th, Sitka, Alaska, Southeast King Salmon quota release higher than last year. So again, it's all not doom and gloom. It depends on what species, I guess, and whereabouts you're located on that map. Because if you're in those warmer waters, like close to California, then chances are your species of salmon are not doing well because of these warmer waters, right? Whereas the other ones further north, well, they're doing much better here because of the water that's changing. So the Alaska Department of Fish and Game announced this week that the harvest limit will be 355,000 um, kings for all gear types, commercial and sport. That's nearly uh, 18,000 above the harvest from last year. Another one, Pacific Blob could scramble the scientists' attempt to forecast the Alaska salmon return. This is a more recent April 26 here. And <clears throat> essentially what they're just speaking about is the fact that they're not sure if the scientists are going to be able to do pull this off here because of this blob. It may have skewed the numbers a little bit here. Um, they said that the issue is biologists are not sure how the warm water known as the Pacific blob affects the different salmon along the West Coast. Well, and this is what I just said to you that I have a feeling it has to do where location, 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 depending where that school of, uh, I mean, where that salmon run all has to return to. So those of them along the west coast that are further towards south, I think you're going to get lower numbers, whereas the ones that are up uh, further north, like myself here in Vancouver Island, I was sharing in last night's show or this morning's show how 
we had a, a fisherman, sorry, not a fisherman, he uh, brings you out on guiding fish tours, uh, oddly enough, right out of Beautiful Girl by Dana's, um, that's the guy who's defrauding everyone on YouTube, right out of his hometown, Powell River, I interviewed the gentleman and he was speaking about how, you know, in the past they were very thrilled to, to see the orcas go by every once in a while. He says, now it's an everyday okay, occasion, they're happening, they're out there all the time. And he also shared in that same interview how there was a massive school of herring, something they hadn't seen in decades. So, yes, I believe the fish are moving around. So if you enjoy this information, folks, uh, I'll mention this again, that you can come to my YouTube channel, Connecting Dots 2, here, as you can see at the top, Connecting Dots 2. And right down here in the Fukushima playlist, you can find a whole lot of Fukushima videos and another location is right here on my website, connectingdots2.com. Hopefully uh, you can find something here that you like and I'll remind you that there's a great search bar here. So anytime you're looking for a specific um, story, that's where you'll find it. Okay, hope you enjoyed the video. Talk to you later. Ciao.